Okay, we're live here at bodybuilding.com. Um, my name's uh, Dr. Jacob Wilson. I'm actually going to have my mate Rudy Moore from the UK. Actually. Hi, everyone. Rudy's actually a researcher in my lab, and he's doing a lot of research right now looking at how to optimize a well-formulated ketogenic diet. So he'll be reading the questions, and I'll be answering them. Just as a little backdrop, um, right now we're doing something new at bodybuilding.com where, you know, as a professor, when I'm able, when I teach a class, uh, the great thing is the people in the class are able to interact with me. And I was like, man, you know, I like writing articles for bodybuilding.com, but I want to be able to talk directly to you. So for all the articles I write now, the muscle prof articles, we'll be actually doing this Google uh, Hangout after. So with that, Rudy, let's, let's get going. Okay, so the first question is from Near Bar. If I'm done with a keto diet and I've lost weight on it, how should I move to a regular diet? Is there a, be a better way to do this? All right, so great question. Basically, <clears throat> this is a major question that we get. If, if I just ketogenic diet it, and I'm fine, and I want to go back to carbs, how should I actually do that? All right, well, here's the thing to understand. So we did uh, a study where basically we had individuals, and they we adapted them for two weeks to a ketogenic diet, and then we had them resistance train for eight weeks. Now, these people lost a lot of body fat when they resistance trained. A lot but then we rapidly switched them back to a carbohydrate diet and they started gaining fat really rapidly and actually I was actually just with a uh, bodybuilding.com athlete and professional physique athlete Chad Homer uh, the other day and he's like hey uh, uh, Jacob he goes I noticed that a lot of phys figure athletes when they go keto they lose a bunch of body fat and then they jump right back to carbs and eat pizza and they gain a bunch of fat well that's actually what we found in our study when we rapidly switched them back to carbs, they started gaining fat at a really high rate. Now, what does this tell us? It tells us that you're no longer, you're used to using fat as your main fuel now. You're not used to using carbs anymore. So how can, it, how can I go back to carbs? So we did a follow-up study where we looked at how do you reintroduce carbohydrates. We took people, we split them into two groups where we gave them one gram of carbohydrates per kilogram of body weight or we gave them three grams of carbohydrate per kilogram of body weight. We found that the one gram of carbohydrate per kilogram of body weight gained no fat. The three grams per kilogram gained fat. What does this mean? You need to reintroduce carbohydrates slowly into your diet. Now, another researcher um, by the name of Paoli just recently did a study. And what they did was they took people and they keto dieted them. They lost a lot of fat. Then they put them back where they reintroduced carbohydrates slowly, so it was 20% of their diet for a few weeks. And then after that, they put them on a moderate carbohydrate, Mediterranean diet. So basically like 40% of their carb diet was carbs, 40, 50%, and then you know 30, 40% protein or whatever. The point is that you wanna have a transition period. So I'd start either by adding one gram per kilogram of body weight a week, or go from low carb, very low carb to maybe 20% carb to maybe 30% carb to to 40, um, but do not rapidly reintroduce carbs or you'll gain fat. If you go slowly back into it, you won't gain fat and you'll maintain the fat loss that you actually had. So great question. Okay, so keto diet, there seems to be a lot of positives to it and this is a, a great question by Jesse. Uh, when you're trying to diet someone, is, is a ketogenic diet the way forward for everybody? Okay, so <clears throat> this is a really good question. Is keto for everyone? Is ketogenic dieting for everyone? Here's the thing. If you look in, in our society, if you look at like, you know, United, United States of America, um, what's going on? Obesity is running rampant right now, right? So people are gaining fat left and right. Well, one of the reasons why this is the case is because we are, our main administration on nutrition is giving a one size fits all approach. So they'll say, maximize carbohydrates minimize fats and proteins and some people are lean and lots of people are obese this is the problem is that there's not a one size of fits approach for everybody right and so i would say the same thing for ketogenic dieting there was a study that was published in jama and what they did was they took individuals took lots of individuals and they put some of them on a ketogenic diet and half and some of them on a on a higher carb low fat diet in the study um, more, they actually lost more body fat in the ketogenic group than they did actually with the carb group. But here's the kicker. 
they went back and did an analysis and they took people and broke them into two groups. The first group they broke them into was insulin resistant and the second group that they broke them into was insulin sensitive. So what does that mean? Basically, being insulin sensitive is how well you can use carbohydrates. So when I eat carbs, how well can I use them? If I'm insulin resistant, I can't use carbs very well at all. The people who are insulin sensitive and can use carbs very well responded to a low fat, um, a low fat diet, uh, and they respond to a ketogenic diet. But the people who couldn't use carbs very well only responded to the ketogenic diet, and they did not respond to the low fat diet. So what it means is that yeah, most people can respond to a ketogenic diet, but the people I would say who would benefit, who are definitely going to benefit, are people who don't use carbs very well. Now I want to emphasize something before I sort of keep going is what is a ketogenic diet just so I preface this statement is a ketogenic diet is 70 to 75 percent of your diet is fat 20 to 25 percent of your diet is protein and about five percent or less of your diet is carbohydrate yeah and as that's crazy as that sounds that's exactly what I said 70 to 75 percent of your diet is fat 20 to 25 percent protein and around five percent carbohydrate it's a good question Okay, so that's great. So when you're on a ketogenic diet, it might change a normal supplement routine. So we've got a great question by Billy here. So what are your thoughts uh, with creatine when you're on a keto diet? Uh, great question, Billy. So um, when you think about it, a key, basically creatine essentially enhances the creatine phosphate system. So that's basically our explosive energy system. And it's very, very important like for bodybuilders. And I think the thing about creatine is whether you're ketogenic dieting or you're on carbs, I would say creatine is one of the most tried and true supplements that I could use, that I would recommend using. So I'd say absolutely uh, use creatine as well. Okay, great. So following on from that point, how does uh, whey protein in a ketogenic diet work? Um, so whey protein in a ketogenic diet? Okay, so here's the thing, right? A lot of times people ask, can I drink straight whey protein when I do a ketogenic diet? Um, and, uh, you know, other people have asked me, could I have straight branch chain amino acids? Well, here's the thing that I kind of want to emphasize to you guys. Um, protein can get converted over to carbohydrate, all right? What determines whether protein gets converted over to carbohydrate is the rate and the speed the protein is digested. So whey protein is, is one of the best proteins you could possibly consume. There's so many health benefits to it. We know it, it's great for skeletal muscle size. But we actually just did a study with Mike Roberts. Um, and this is the first study I know of that really looked at this. But <clears throat> So we did this study, and we gave whey protein by itself. What we found is that it raised insulin, and it lowered blood ketones. Now, nutritional ketosis is a state in which your body stops using carbs as its main fuel source and switches to using primarily ketones and fat as its primary fuel source. Okay? So, and you want your ketones to be about 0.5 millimolars or above to say you're actually in ketosis. So what happened was that the weight alone digested so rapidly that part of it's getting converted to glucose and it's actually raising insulin levels. So what you want to do is you don't want to have the whey protein alone. Keep consuming whey, but have it with a fat source, um, and that will ensure that the whey gets spared, it doesn't get converted over to glucose, and it won't kick you down, your ketone levels down. So that's a great question, and that, that's definitely how I responded. And also I would say that probably protein blends, like whey, casein, combo, will be slower digesting. Oh, um, and actually that's one thing Rudy's going to be testing in our lab here is um, – different proteins and how they affect ketosis. Okay, great. So talking of protein, does uh, it affect sort of your protein intake? Can you get away, you know, you, you mentioned taking in less protein per day. Will that affect muscle mass uh, and weight loss and maintaining muscle when dieting? Okay, it's a really great question. So basically, it's one thing that I address sort of um, in the Muscle Prof article, okay? And, and one of the biggest questions is, if my protein's this low, how can I gain muscle? We know we got to have a ton of protein, right? Okay, first I want to emphasize something. Protein on this diet is not low. It's moderate, all right? If you look at the RDA, the recommended dietary allowance, it's 0.8 grams of carbs, excuse me, 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. 
right? That's like 0.3 or whatever, um, you know, per, per pound. That's so small. So we're talking about 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight is the recommended daily allowance. The recommended daily allowance was basically recommended to prevent deficiencies, okay? On a ketogenic diet, you're talking about your protein being around 20 to 25% of your diet, which typically works out at maintenance at around 1.5 to 1.8 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight, or 0.8 to 0.9 grams um, per pound of body weight. So that's not low. It's still double the recommended daily allowance. Um, the key to understand is this. When you're in a ketogenic diet, there was research back in the, uh, um, by Steve Finney in 1980 and 1983. groundbreaking research. He took people and put them on a ketogenic diet, and at rest, he found their ketones were super high, but guess what else was super high? Their branched chain amino acids in their blood. So their branched chain amino acids in their blood were way higher than the group that was carb adapted. So why is this the case? Why does this actually happen? Turns out that ketones spare the breakdown of amino acids. So there was actually a recent study that actually came out by Dumeris Lab. It actually literally just came out in the last few days. They did a lifelong study in animals where they put them on a keto diet their whole life, and they found that the molecular pathways that break down protein were decreased on a ketogenic diet. So what does that mean? You're not going to break down protein as much. So if you had, for example, if you had 0 0.8 uh, to 0 0.9 grams per pound of protein, it might be more like 1.4 to 1.5 grams of protein on a ketogenic diet because ketones will block or prevent you from breaking down your own protein. And we have evidence to, to support that. In fact, if you infuse ketones into the blood, you spare the breakdown of branched-chain amino acids. And remember, branched-chain amino acids like leucine are the primary trigger for skeletal muscle growth. So that's a great question. And I would say you can absolutely gain muscle on that amount of protein. Okay, perfect. So what about the use of an actual ketone supplement? Does that help with a, a ketogenic diet? Okay, so <clears throat> the use of the ketogenic supplement is actually a really, really interesting topic. Um, actually, Rudy here by me um, actually just did some research on this. And uh, Rudy actually gave um, ketones in our lab, and he actually found that they increased focus. So actually, individuals were focused more. So let me explain something. So when you do a ketogenic diet, um, you're switching your fuel source to fat and ketones. Now, ketones themselves uh, are the most efficient fuel source we actually have in our body. They actually produce more energy uh, per gram, you know, per unit than any other source. So they're very, very efficient fuel source. So when you take them, actually, like I said, Rudy's study showed that actually makes you more focused. We've more recently done research where I actually found that ketones themselves might actually increase like fat metabolism. The other thing about ketones that's really beneficial is we found that they actually will lower blood glucose. Now, why is this the case? Research shows that when you actually infuse ketones, it increases insulin sensitivity. Um, when you infuse ketones, so your millimolars of, of ketones are, are fairly high, like you're in ketosis, it actually increases insulin sensitivity quite drastically. What does that mean? You're using, you can use carbs more efficiently. And so um, I would say ketone supplements should be very, very beneficial. Now, where would it be most beneficial is when you first start ketogenic dieting. And the reason why is because most people quit like in the first few days. Like I, I know many people have come to me and going, hey, you know what? I tried ketogenic dieting. I'll never do it again. It's just horrible. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, let me ask you a question. Like, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Uh, how long do you ketogenic diet? I tried it for five days. Okay. So the problem is that uh, that person hasn't actually adapted to the diet. It takes time to adapt to the diet. And so, because their body's not producing enough ketones to fuel their brain, so they have brain fog. So if you supplement early on, now you actually have enough ketones so it makes the adaptation period um, better. As far as performance and, and body composition changes, we don't know. Um, our lab is actually working really hard to find the answer to those questions. Okay, great. So a question from Jacob. Uh, can you just uh, quickly explain the difference between ketosis and ketoacidosis? 
Uh, yeah, Ro nice name by the way, uh, and uh, great question. So, okay, one of the things I, I one of the main questions uh, I get in almost every conference that I go and speak at is, isn't ketogenic diet aren't blood ketones really bad for you? Um, doesn't it cause you your you to become acidic? You know, or you know, I thought ketoacidosis was bad. Well, it turns out that this is what happens. Ketoacidosis is a metabolic state uh, that generally is associated with diabetes, uncontrolled diabetes. When you don't control diabetes, okay, ketones skyrocket so that in your blood, we measure ketones in millimolars in the blood, that they're anywhere from 15 to 20 millimolars in your blood. So imagine your key, if your blood ketones are like 20 millimolars, okay? Uh, ketones will actually increase that at that level you actually will become acidic you actually um, develop ketoacidosis when you actually do a ketogenic diet that uh, um, ketosis is 0.5 millimolars in our studies the average amount even after 10 weeks is usually around 1.5 millimolars and the range generally is 0.5 millimolars to maybe 5 millimolars now some people get a little bit higher than that but we, but at that level, 0.5 to 3 or 0.5 to 5 millimolars, which we call nutritional ketosis, you don't actually uh, go become acidic, and so it's perfectly healthy. So that's the difference between two. Great question, Jacob. Okay, so uh, we've already talked about protein intake, but Catherine's kind of asking more towards building muscle. And one kind of common question is obviously we're, we're very low on carbohydrates, so can we, can we add muscle or gain mass uh, in the absence of carbohydrates and while on a ketogenic diet? Uh, Catherine, that's an awesome question. Um, so basically, so, so here's the thing. Um, do you need carbs to grow? You know, that's, that's one of the real questions that we have. So there is research actually um, in 2012 by a scientist and his team uh, by the name of Staples. And basically what Staples did was they took individuals and after a workout, now they were carb adapted, mind. they were eating normal carbs, but not on the workout. So they trained and they were fasted and immediately after workout, they either had whey protein alone or they had whey protein plus carbs. And they looked at protein synthesis. And what they found is that, and they looked at protein breakdown. What they found is that uh, adding carbs to the whey protein did not increase protein synthesis. It was the same amount. And when they actually had, uh, when they had the, the, the carbohydrates, it didn't actually decrease protein breakdown more than when you had protein alone, which is interesting. Flash forward to a more recent study in our laboratory um, by one, one of the uh, scientists that used to work in my lab, Sean McClary and others. We actually did a study where we had moderate carbohydrates. So basically people were eating about we gave them uh, excess of calories, but they had about 300 grams of carbs in their diet, and then plus, uh, you know, a, a good amount. We had another group where we gave them the same 200 grams of protein, but we upped their carbs to 600 grams of carbs a day. And guess what happened? Both groups gained the same amount of muscle, but the group on 600 grams of carbs gained a lot of fat. So. You know, from zero to adding carbs post workout didn't help. From going from 300 to 600 grams, it didn't help. What happens when you eliminate carbohydrates? We recently did a study where we took uh, highly trained resistance trained athletes, a lot of guys benching 315 pounds. You know, there were well, a lot of guys squatting over two times their body weight. And we keto adapted them for two weeks. And then we had both groups train for eight weeks one keto, one not keto, one Western, one high carb they both gained around the same amount of lean mass. So I don't know, you know, um, there's a lot of different combinations we have, and I'm not saying, I don't know if you can optimize muscle growth with, with a ketogenic diet. We need more studies, but I can tell you from the research that we do have, you can gain muscle. And in fact, our lab teamed up with Mike Roberts and did two studies recently. So these, we did the human model where we saw you can gain muscle. Then we did a molecular model where we actually had uh, rats <laughs> resistance train, right? <laughs> so without getting into how you get rats to resistance train, basically we put one group on a ketogenic diet group and one group was on an actual uh, high carb group, group. And what we found is that both groups stimulated protein synthesis at the molecular level to the same extent. There's very little carbs. 
compared to high carbs. And then long term after resistance training, both increased muscle size and we took out muscle and looked at it directly. So in both human models and animal models and at the molecular level itself, this data strongly suggests that yes, you can gain muscle when you keep on a ketogenic diet. Okay, great. And all the benefits of uh, kind of being on a keto diet, is it something we could do long term? How, you know, is it too hard to adhere to or what do you feel? Okay, <clears throat> so this is a really um, great question. You know, one thing I hear basically the question a lot of people say, and, and let me emphasize something again. I want to emphasize this again before I get into this question. I recently was speaking with my good friend Mark Coles. He's, he's also from the UK, and he's one of the best coaches actually in the UK in bodybuilding. And he said, you know, one thing, Doc, he goes, that I notice is that coaches usually put their clients on what they're comfortable with. So if you have a coach who's a power lifter, they'll have their clients power lift. If you have a coach who likes high carbs, they'll have them do high carbs. If you have a coach who likes ketogenic dieting, they'll have their clients do ketogenic dieting. He goes, but it's not about that. He goes, one of the things I've had success with in my practice is basically uh, having a bunch of different tools in the toolbox. And I think that's very, very important when you do a ketogenic diet is that you have uh, different tools in the toolbox. So, for example, he had a client who last year going into their contest couldn't get their legs lean, and they're in like 1,400, 1,500 calories. This year, six, six weeks out, on a, and they're on a normal carb diet, this year, six weeks out, they're on a ketogenic diet and eating 1,000 more calories a day, and their legs were leaner six weeks out than they were in the contest. So what this says, there's tools in the toolbox, but some people might not respond as well to a keto diet. They might respond better to a carb diet. So I'm not here telling you that ketogenic diet's what you need to follow. It's just a tool, okay? If you decide to use that tool, can you do it long-term is this question. So there was basically a meta-analysis by Hesion, and it was in 2005, and they compared all the studies that were ketogenic versus the higher carb. And what they found is that you could adhere just as good on a ketogenic diet as a carb diet, and in most cases, better, okay? So a lot of people are like, oh my God, it's so restrictive, you know, I can't, here's the thing, you have to get good at actually cooking. So like, um, you want to think of it like that, you got to get good at, you got to get good at learning the diet. So you can use, for example, different flours to, to make crust. You can make pizza, for example, with cauliflower crust. You can use um, almond flour to make like crust for pizza. Um, you can you can eat um, and cooking with high fat. It's not hard. You can make uh, keto brownies. You can make um, like I said pizzas and eat you know bacon, um, blue cheese. You can and you can substitute a lot of carbohydrate type food with low lower carbohydrate foods. So if you get good at cooking, it's you can adhere to it. The other thing is there is if you look there is a study by Blackburn. And what they did was they took individuals and they dieted them down for 18 weeks on a high-carb diet. They came back a year later and told them, hey, keep following this low-fat diet. A year later, they had regained all their fat. There was a study by Nielsen, and they took individuals. And Nielsen took individuals, and it was in 2008, and dieted them down. So they lost 10 to 15% of their body weight on a keto diet. Now, it took them to do this. It took them... Uh, 14 months okay and after this diet actually had occurred they then left them they stopped controlling the diet and said hey keep following the ketogenic diet we'll see you um, in 44 months <clears throat> so no nothing else but saying follow the ketogenic diet they came back 44 months later and these individuals had maintained the majority of their weight loss so it actually is something you can do long term do you have to do it long term no, there are ways that you can transition back, like we talked about at the beginning of this show. You can transition back first to a low carb diet and then to a moderate carb, uh, moderate protein, moderate fat diet. You can absolutely do that, but but it is something that can be adhered to. Okay, great. So, is it for weight loss? Is a ketogenic diet just helping through uh, kind of being in an energy deficit and making you eat less, or is there any sort of potential metabolic advantages of being in a keto diet? Great question. Okay, so uh, this is a controversial question, and the question basically is: Does ketogenic dieting just help because it makes you more satiated, <clears throat> therefore you eat less calories, 
or is there a unique metabolic advantage of ketogenic diet? Because it's a controversial question, I'm obviously going to need to answer this with research. I'm a scientist. It's kind of what I do, okay? All right, so there was a study, a real great study by Jeff Volick in 2004 in his group. And Jeff Volick's one of the pioneers of ketogenic dieting. Probably one of him and Dominique D'Agostino, probably two of the best researchers in the world on this topic. So what, what Jeff Volick actually did was he, he gave people a low-fat diet or a ketogenic dieting group. Now let me say this. If I take you and you have like moderate carbs, moderate fat, moderate protein, I say go keto and cut out, you know, 95% uh, of your carbs in your diet. Just because you're cutting out carbs, you're probably going to lower your calories. On the other hand, if I take someone who's eating higher fat, um, higher carbs, and higher protein, and I say cut out the fat, they're also going to lower their calories naturally. Because anytime you remove a macronutrient, you remove variety, your calories are going to naturally lower. The question is, how does a ketogenic diet compare to a high-carb diet as far as lowering calories? Both you'll lower calories, but compared to each other. Volick answered this in 2004. He gave people a ketogenic diet or a carb diet, and they could eat kind of what they want. The people on the ketogenic diet selected out 1,800 calories. The people who had the low-fat diet ate 1,500 calories. Okay, Guess who lost more fat? It was a ketogenic dieting group. Now, researchers will point out that, well, here's the problem with the study. So remember, the keto diet had 300 more calories. They didn't eat less. So you won't necessarily eat less. Okay? What will happen is you'll be more satiated, but you won't necessarily eat less. Now, what happened, though, is this, that the, the keto group actually ate more protein than the low-fat group. So researchers will point that out and go, well, how do you know it's ketogenic dieting? Maybe it's just a protein. So basically... This is really um, the, the answer to this question. There, there, there is something that actually is unique, we think, about being in a ketogenic diet. There was a study by Dr. Young in 1971. It was one of the most classic studies that had ever been done. Because a lot of people go, why don't I just lower my carbs? Or I'll, I'll lower insulin that way. There's nothing special about being in ketosis. So Young does a study where basically he took people and he put them on um, – 100 grams of carbs a day, 60 grams of carbs a day, or 30 grams of carbs a day. So 160 and 30. All groups got the same amount of protein. Now, I think everyone who's listening would agree that that's a very low-carb diet in all of them. They found that the group that lost the most body fat, even though calories were the same, even though protein was the same, the group that lost the more, most body fat was the group that was on 30 grams of carbs a day. The group that lost the least amount of body fat was a group that was 100 grams of carbs a day, and that group lost the, low, lost, lost the most amount of muscle. What was the difference between the groups? Blood ketones were the highest in the 30 gram per day group. So ketones, as I said before, spare muscle. And when you spare muscle, you maintain a better metabolic rate. In addition, there is some research that suggests that ketones actually activate a tissue that's in our body called brown adipose tissue. And brown adipose tissue is very thermically active and basically it speeds our metabolism. And so that might be happening there. The other thing I want to point out too is that people think, one of the questions I have is, oh, if I don't have glucose, you know, how can I function? When you're on a ketogenic diet, Dr. Steve Finney found that you actually maintain your normal blood glucose levels, fasting levels. So if your normal levels are 80 to 100 milligrams for deciliter fasting, you still maintain that keto dieting, okay? So, but because your brain still needs some carbs and your red blood cells need carbs. So how do you produce those? Well, if you're having, if you have high ketones, you're not going to break down muscle. So that means you got to get it from fat. And fat, to actually take fat, there's a small portion of fat that can get converted to carbs. It's called glycerol. You have to break down a lot of fat and it is very inefficient. This is called gluconeogenesis. And so that provides what we think is a metabolic advantage. More recently, our lab teamed up with Mike Roberts. And basically what we did was um, we did a study where we had a, a Western group, which is a higher carb group, and then we had a keto group. They ate the same amount of calories. Then we had a higher protein, kind of lower fat group, and the higher protein group actually ate less calories than the ketogenic dieting group. 
okay? But the ketogenic dieting group lost more fat than all the groups. So even though the keto was eating more calories than one of the groups, they lost more body fat than them. And even though they were eating the same amount of calories as the Western high carb group, they lost more body fat. And this was controlling for a lot of variables. So that means that I think there it may be a metabolic advantage to ketogenic dieting. Uh, yes. Okay, great. So obviously, whatever diet you're on, you know, training <clears throat> still an important part of, of the lifestyle. And Kelly kind of was asking here about training volume. Uh, frequency and then also a lot of people ask about intensity how would you change it or would you change it at all when switching to a keto diet okay it's a great question I think one of the things we get is like well I'm going through this adaptation phase you know when you switch to keto you're not used to using fats as your fuel and the thing is like man what do I do I you know I can't focus much should I back off on my training as I'm adapting uh, one of the head researchers in my laboratory, Ryan Lowry, actually um, was talking about this the other day. And he, one thing he pointed out was this. when What happens, why do we keto adapt? Well, our, our muscles and our liver store what's known as, they store carbohydrates. When you run out of carbohydrates or you're low on carbohydrates, that's when your liver is forced to produce ketones. So if you wait a long time to de deplete carbohydrates, it's going to take you longer to adapt. If you go into the weight room or you go to the gym hard and do interval training and deplete glycogen faster or carbohydrates faster, even though it might be harder, you'll kick into ketosis faster. So my advice is to power through it. Go in there, do interval training. Yeah, it's going to be hard at first deplete your glycogen levels so you force your liver to have to produce ketones. Overall, I would say that's going to be much better for ketogenic dieting. Okay, great. So moving back to supplements now, Jacob's had a question on MCT oil. What would you kind of recommend for, for sort of a daily intake or adding MCT oil to help you maybe get into a ketogenic diet faster? Would you think that's a good idea? Okay, it's a really good question. So, um, Okay, so basically, yes, one thing I want to, I want to, just a little background here. We have different types of fats, right? We have short chain fatty acids, we have medium chain uh, fatty acids, and then we also have lo your long chain fatty acids. So when I have longer chain fatty acids, they go through a complex process in my digestive tract before they can actually get into the blood and get to the muscle. And once they get into the muscle, they actually have to be transported into your fat burning machinery, which is the mitochondria. So that takes a long time and it's a slow process. And so um, ultimately fats <clears throat> get converted to ketones. The faster you actually metabolize or burn fat, the more ketones you'll actually produce. So what does this mean? Um, medium chain triglycerides are special types of fats that actually are, are s smaller and they can diffuse straight from your digestive tract to the blood, straight into the muscle, and they don't require a transporter to get into the mitochondria to be burned. So they get actually, and they're very hard to store as fat as well. So they get used so fast as fuel that you can't keep pace, and they get converted over to ketones very rapidly. They get converted over to ketones much more faster than long chains. So what happens is like a lot of people, like I know uh, Dominique D'Agostino does this. Um, he's one of the top researchers on ketogenic dieting. He'll have breakfast and then his snack he'll have, he'll have some coffee and he'll put medium chain triglycerides in it and it'll give him kind of brain fuel. And the reason why is because it's converting to ketones and it's filling your brain. So I think absolutely medium chains are great. I want to point something out to you though. <clears throat> um, one of the questions that, that actually is actually being asked right now is uh, that <laughs> basically um, they use, the, the person used several servings of medium chain triglycerides, like five servings, and they had stomach issues. Um, so bodybuilders, physique athletes, figure athletes, one thing that we know and, and, uh, is that, oh, well, a little's good. More must be better, right? In the case of medium chain triglycerides, I caution against that. Your stomach's going to have to adapt to them. So if you go and go, I'm doing a keto diet, I'm going to go get medium chain triglycerides, If you, you need to start off with like half a serving and then work your way up to like a 10-gram serving 
because once you get past five, 10 grams, you start hurting your stomach. You'll hurt your stomach quite a bit. So first start off slowly and then probably, you know, max you're going to go up to is maybe like 10 grams because it's going to start to hurt your stomach. That'll impair your workouts and you don't want that. Okay, great. So we've had a, a question by Grace and uh, it comes up a lot. Can you just kind of go into just how basics of setting up a ketogenic diet in terms of working you know, the 75% fat intake, how do you get that right so you're still uh, losing weight at the same time? Okay, so it's great, great question. Um, here's the thing I want to point out, okay? So here's the thing. One of the things that um, Dr. Jeff Volk talks about, whenever he talks about ketogenic diet, there's one, there's such a thing as a ketogenic diet and then there's such a thing as a well-formulated ketogenic diet, okay? A well-formulated, again, is 70 to 75% fat is your, is your diet. I know like um, 10 years ago was the first time I tried a ketogenic diet and I was like, this is horrible. I feel awful, right? And what I was really doing is kind of like uh, what I call more like a bro ketogenic diet. And basically what I was doing is I, I was just like, well, I don't understand. I'm just eating meat and, um, you know, meat and, and protein and my, and I almost have no carbs. Why do I feel horrible? And the reason why is because when protein is too high, it kicks you out of ketosis because it gets converted to carbs. So the main thing you want to do is you want to select out foods that are higher in fat um, or, or add fats, okay? So if you have, for example, if you have a salad and you add some meat to it, add ranch dressing to that, right? Add cheese to that. Um, if, you, if you're drinking coffee, add heavy cream to that. Add some MCT to that. So if the addition of fats is very, very important. And then the selecting out of fattier cuts of meat so you're not going to want to select out 94% uh, percent lean ground beef. You're going to select 80%, right? You're going to go with more like the prime uh, rib, right? The very fatty cuts as opposed to the very lean sirloins. You're going to go with chicken thighs instead of chicken breasts. Kind of all the opposite that you would normally think of on a bodybuilding diet. You're actually going to eat real bacon and not turkey bacon, right? So those are selections that make it, I think, a lot easier to, to be in a ketogenic diet. Okay, that's perfect. So we've talked about kind of general training, but in terms of actual kind of cardio training or even high-intensity interval training, should you do that on ketosis? And uh, any advice in terms of uh, steady-state cardio or overhit training? What are your thoughts? Okay, so great, real great question. Um, so here's what here's what I point out. So basically, um, if you are to do like if you're actually going to do um, like uh, hit training or interval training, again, when you first start keto dieting, you you're going to notice that uh, at first you're not doing it as well. Um, and it, but basically, there's a study by Yeo in 2008, and what they found was that at first you're not going to do the interval as well, but after ten after actually after six sessions, there was no difference. You can do the interval as good. Okay. So <clears throat> the reason why I recommend high intensity cardio is because um, essentially um, in a ketogenic state, your carbohydrates are low. What triggers us to actually burn fat? What triggers your muscles to say, I need to add mitochondria, right? Um, you know, I actually need to add um, uh, fat burning machinery. Well, it's not going to say that unless carbohydrates are depleted in the muscle. So when you are in a ketogenic state, there's research from Hansen in 2005, Yeo again 2008, and others, that when you train in a low-carbohydrate state, you actually increase the mitochondria, which will enhance your ability to burn fat. So I highly recommend using high-intensity interval training. Um, as far as low-intensity steady state, I would caution limiting that because low-intensity steady state cardio has been shown. We published a paper in Journal Strength Conditioning Research where we showed a dose-dependent response. The more steady state cardio you do, the more, uh, the worse it is for gaining muscle. So I'd recommend more high intensity for sure. Okay, great. And we've spoke about the positives of a keto diet, uh, but Art brought up about uh, sort of bad breath when on a keto diet. So maybe could you speak about that and if there's also any other negatives of uh, being on a ketogenic diet? Okay, so basically um, people, the thing is when someone's keto dieting, um, you, so, sometimes it doesn't even happen to most people, and it does disappear. Is that um, one when one of the um, byproducts is acetone, and that has a fruity smell. So it's not bad breath; it's more like a fruity smell. 
Um, so it's not necessarily a, a negative effect. What, what I'm going to say, and usually it disappears and it doesn't happen in everyone. What, what I'm going to say is, are there negative effects of ketogenic dieting? Um, <clears throat> here's the negative effects that I've seen in our research. Number one, when you first go into a ketogenic diet, um, you're not adapted. You've been using carbs your whole life as your main fuel source. So I remember the first time that I actually did like a real ketogenic diet. And, you know, I'm a, 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 you know I, I am a professor, you know, at a university. So I end up teaching. I'm teaching my students. And I'm like four or five days in. And I'm lecturing. And I'm like, yeah, I asked the class, like, what? Yeah, what did I just say? <laughs> and, uh, and basically, and I asked it like a, three or four times because my brain was foggy because it was used to using carbs as main fuel. And my ketones were low. So the first negative would be that you've got to go through this adaptation phase. And that's going to take time. And we'll get to that question later, but that's going to actually take time to occur. Um, the next thing to sort of understand is that, um, so that's the first thing. But once you get past that, you're fine. Now, also, initially, when you go into a ketogenic diet, maybe the first week or two weeks, your blood lipids or your blood fats will actually go up. And that's not a good thing. But after, like, four to six weeks, now your actually blood lipids, like your triglycerides and your cholesterol, might actually go down. So that's the initial phase that you have. I'm going to tell you, once you've gotten past that, then everything's good if you have a well-formulated ketogenic diet. And that's where I'm actually going to get into, that's where I'm going to emphasize this. The bad side effects of ketogenic dieting are when it's not well-formulated. And this is what I mean by that. Someone, again, will go, we'll do the bro ketogenic diet and go high protein, moderate to low fat, low carb. They'll never get into ketosis and they'll feel horrible. So you got to keep the ratios right. The second thing is they'll go, oh, cool. I can eat bacon and burgers. That's all I'm going to eat. Basically, it's going to eat bacon, burgers, pour bacon fat on everything. And what are they missing? They're missing vegetables. Okay. And, and vegetables are very, very important because, um, one of the concerns with ketogenic dieting is that basically, uh, and Ryan Lowry will like this in, in my lab, he's doing a lot of research on this, and look for that, by the way. Um, 90, over 90% of our cells are bacteria. And what we know is that you have good bacteria, you have bad bacteria. And um, the good bacteria are responsible for us being full, satiated, being very insulin sensitive. Even our brains are affected drastically by your bacteria. Well, the good bacteria eat fiber. They eat the carbs that your normal small intestine can't eat. Well, if you are just eating bacons and bur bacon and burgers and cheese, there's no fiber there. There's no resistant starch. So you, for a well-formulated ketogenic diet, you got to have a lot of vegetables. Okay, get a lot of fiber in your diet. Maybe even supplement with a fiber supplement or a prebiotic. Now you're feeding the good bacteria and you eliminate losing or starving the good bacteria. So those would be the main things that I would say could be negative, but those can be overcome with a well-formulated diet that's adapted to. Okay, that's great. And we, we've got a really good question up there by Grace now, and it's a very common one that, that I think we get. Uh, in terms of uh, a cyclic keto diet or a targeted one, how, what are your thoughts on that? Okay, uh, Grace, really great question. <clears throat> um, okay. One of the things I had thought about, so um, remember I told you our, one of our first studies that we did in our lab, we, we had people do 10 weeks of keto, and then we rapidly put them back on carbs. What we saw, they gained fat pretty fast. And I was like, well, there's got to be a way around that. There's been a lot of books that have come out, lots of books, that basically are like, oh, guess what you should do? You have um, go keto on, the, on weekdays, Monday through Friday, and carb up on the, on the weekends. The theory is that if I deplete glycogen during the week, on the weekends, all the carbs are just going to go to my muscles and I won't store fat. So I can go out, eat a ton of carbs, and basically what does it mean? I could have my cake and eat it too. Now, I thought this was awesome. And I was like, you know what? This is great. If this works, I'm 100% I'm, I'm in. <laughs> so basically, I hypothesized that people – so we did a study. We took a group and we dieted them, so they were trying to lose body fat. In fact, we dieted them to the point where they lost three kilograms which is about seven pounds. And basically what we did was we had one group that did pure ketogenic dieting with a calorie deficit and interval training, meaning that they were 75% fat, 70-75% uh, fat, 20% carb, 5% protein. 
And um, then we had another group that did stick like Monday through Friday they did keto and on the weekends we carved them up. Okay. Now I hypothesized that the cyclic ketogenic diet will work better. I was all about it, like this is going to work. And um, at the end, we looked once we we looked at the data, and both groups lost the same amount of weight, three kilograms of weight. Okay. Now, guess what happened though? My hypothesis was completely wrong. And that's the great thing about science is like you can go talk and you can say, well, what about this? What about that? But you know what? We put it to the test, and I was wrong. It turned out that the, the ketogenic diet group of those three, three kilograms, all of them were fat. The cyclic ketogenic dieting group, the majority of the weight they lost was muscle. Oh, whoa, 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 wait a second here. The majority of the weight they lost was muscle. Now, why is that the case? We went back and we looked at their blood ketones. Remember, you need to be 0.5 millimolars or above. We found that individuals basically who did a cyclic group did not actually get into ketosis until Thursday or Friday. And even then it was small ketosis, like it was 0.5 millimolars Thursday and Friday. They weren't in Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Whereas the keto group was like 1.5 and above the entire study. Remember ketone spare lean mass. What, what's going on is that if you are going high fat, low carb, you eat carbs on the weekends, your body's like, oh, carbs are our main fuel source. You go into Monday, you eliminate carbs. Now your ketones are low. So carbs aren't sparing muscle. Ketones aren't sparing muscle, but your brain says, I need carbs for fuel. So what's it going to do? It's going to go and convert muscle, break it down, and turn it to glucose. And now you're going to lose muscle at a high rate. Plus, what's going to happen is your performance is going to go down because these people never actually keto adapted. So we did like a, we tested a German volume training protocol which is like a, um, a, a high volume protocol, the people in the ketogenic group improve their strength endurance and their strength. The people in the cyclic ketogenic diet group decrease their strength and their strength endur endurance. So what I would say is that I would not do an extreme cyclic ketogenic diet. Targeted ketogenic diet, on the other hand, that's actually basically Rudy. So Rudy Moore here uh, is doing research. He's got a team in the lab um, with a, uh, Chris Irving and, and Will as well and uh, Ryan Lowry, they're basically looking at what happens with all these variables. Like for example, how high can we get their protein or what about targeted? Can you do targeted and stay? Now what is targeted? Targeted is where you actually have carbohydrates just before the workout. Now remember what I said when we gave carbohydrates at one gram per kilogram body weight, you didn't gain fat. What I would look at carbs as when you're ketogenic dieting, I look at them as an ergogenic aid. Look at them as almost like a supplement. You know, like if you take your pre-workout, uh, carbs actually have a brain effect. So there's actual research that's done by um, Eukendrup. Uh, um, Eukendrup, and basically what Eukendrup has done is he's taking carbohydrates. You take them, he had the athletes rinse in their mouth and spit the carbs out. So they didn't actually digest them, and they performed better. Why? Because carbohydrates stimulate reward centers, make us happy, and decrease our perceived exertion. So maybe if you had a little bit, like 30, you actually would focus better and have a better training session, and maybe it wouldn't kick you out of ketosis. We don't know this. We're going to test this. Rudy's going to test this in our lab, and we're going to actually see, does that actually happen? Let me give you some, let me say something, though, real quick. There was a study by Goodyear, and I think it was 1998. And basically what Goodyear did was he gave carbohydrates. He gave 30 grams of carbohydrates uh, 60 minutes before individuals worked out, 30 minutes, and immediately before. At 60 and 30 minutes before they worked out, the carbs raised insulin levels. Okay? When he gave it immediately before exercise, insulin didn't in increase. Why? Because when you work out, adrenaline goes up very high. Adrenaline suppresses the pancreas's ability to release insulin. Insulin is what stops us, stops you from being ketogenic. So if you were to have carbs right before you worked out, you likely would just use them as fuel. Um, and in fact, uh, Jeff Folick has done research where he found when you give carbs during the workout with endurance athletes, that they're still using just as much fat as fuel. So I would say probably a moderate amount of carbs before your workout could be beneficial, and we just have to research that more.
Okay, perfect. And in terms of if someone doesn't want to use carbohydrates, but you know they may be lacking a bit of energy while while getting in or going on a ketogenic diet, do you feel the use of MCT oil or MCTs could help with that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, you know, going back to like what what the question Jake was asking earlier, um, even if you're keto adapted. <clears throat> medium chain triglycerides are going to be very, very important for you, and they definitely help uh, 100%. You feel a lot better. You feel clear. You feel more focused, um, and uh, and I think that's very, very important. So, again, one of the things is um, MCTs are not going to make you necessarily um, burn more fat, although I will say this. If I gave you MCTs and I gave you another fat, there is research that shows that your metabolic rate will go up more with MCTs, definitely in the short term, and you will oxidize more fat. There's really clear research on that. There's also research where, like, if you put people on a calorie deficit uh, and you give them uh, either MCTs or a normal long-chain fat, they actually do lose more fat. Now, if you're just going to eat whatever you want to eat and you have MCTs, that alone is not going to make you lose fat, okay? It's important to distinguish between the two. Now, one of the questions is, is what foods are high in medium chain triglycerides? Okay, well, you want to think about it. Um, uh, basically, dairy-based uh, um, um, foods are going to be really high. Now, why is that the case? Because you're going to think about like milk and things like that or creams are going to be high in that because babies are going to need like medium chain triglycerides because they're easy digested fat. Um, and, and so, and actually babies use a lot of ketones as fuel. So when you, when you drink dairy-based products, they're going to be higher in MCTs. So like cream could be around, you know, anywhere from four to twenty percent medium chain triglyceride. Now, coconut oil is about fifty percent medium chain triglyceride. And so, um, one thing you find is like if you have straight MCTs, that the blood ketones will peak higher, but they'll go down faster. If you have coconut oil, it doesn't peak as high, but it lasts much longer. So probably having um, Heavy cream, um, you know, you could actually um, whip heavy cream and make like an ice cream out of it, um, <clears throat> or having coconut oil and MCTs. Now you're getting different curves and you're sustaining higher levels of blood ketones. So, yeah, I would definitely recommend that. Okay, perfect. And um, just talking about those sort of foods, obviously. Uh, when you're on a normal diet and you're out and about rushing around, you can pick up snacks quite easily. Have you got any sort of suggestions when I'm on a ketogenic diet, what to snack on or in between meals, what I could use if I'm in a hurry? Great question. So um, here's the thing. So if you're going to snack on, on stuff, because that, that's what a really great question is like, it's easy to grab a carb, easy to grab a cracker or granola bar, right? What do I do if I'm actually ketogenic dieting? It's hard. Well, if you like, if you have the munchies or something like that, um, one thing that are like fat bombs are actually uh, macadamia nuts. They're like 90% fat. Um, almonds are high in fat. You can snack on those. Cheese um, is is th are things that you can actually snack on. Of course, any kind of vegetable that you can take. But I would say nuts, particularly macadamia nuts, Brazilian nuts, those are going to be your highest in fat. Uh, so you don't have to be um, as careful with those. Almonds, probably a little bit more careful. You can't just eat them ad lib. But uh, those are some examples of things that you can uh, actually eat. Okay, and what about if I uh, was on a ketogenic diet and I hit a plateau? Would, would you recommend coming off? If so, how long should I, should I wait or any sort of techniques I could use? Okay, really great question. So um, when we talk about plateauing, you know, any, any diet – you're going to eventually hit a steady state, right? Your body's always uh, sort of adapting. And what I would say is that one thing is that you need to continue to monitor. There's a study basically they show, oh, long-term ketogenic dieting, you plateau. But if you look at the study, they actually had reintroduced carbs and it kind of creeped back up to 60 grams per day. I notice a lot of times when people do plateau, their carbs are kind of creeping up. So the first thing I would say is reassess your diet, uh, start tracking your macros, and sort of make sure that you actually are in ketosis. That's the first thing that I would say. Two, you might need to change up your training split. You know, maybe add in more interval training. That could actually help. Also, one thing you can do to avoid the plateau, there's research on people call it calorie cycling, but there's a, uh, there's a scientist who basically studied this, and they called it uh, calorie shifting. 
Um, and actually, Rudy and I were talking about this the other day, where basically they went lower calorie for 11 days, and then for three days, they went back to maintenance calories. Then they did lower calorie for three days and went to maintenance calories. Those people actually didn't plateau. So possibly you might not necessarily go back to carbs, you might cycle your calories and that might help you avoid a plateau. So basically again, you have periods where maybe you have a slight calorie deficit, then go to maintenance. Maybe even one of those days go slightly above maintenance. And that's I think what I would recommend. Now if you're like, you know, I've, I've reached my body weight when I come off, then again, yes you could transition back to carbs but do it slowly. And then because Paoli actually found that when you went keto, then went 20% carb and then went back to moderate carb, when those people went back to keto, they lost fat again. So that could be something that you use as sort of a tool in the toolbox. So there's a bunch of different things you could do. I'd say one, the other, or combination thereof. Okay. So we, we've just had a question kind of if we were going to start tomorrow, say, can you maybe just summarize for us a couple of techniques for, say, meal prep, a couple of supplements we might, might want to consider, <clears throat> just so, you know, if we were going to go ahead, what you know, what are a few tips we can take away from today? Okay, so if I were to summarize this up again, number one is I would track. It's not, you know, like one of the questions I actually did, did see on there was, um, is it okay if I just kind of eye my foods and say, oh yeah, this high fat, that's moderate protein, that's low carb? I would say that if you're really good at tracking, you've been tracking for years, maybe you could do that. But like even someone who's experienced, I would highly recommend the first thing you do is set up a tracking account. Whatever that is, um, set up tracking accounts so you can track your macronutrients. And so I would get a scale, you know, or, or measuring cups, and I'd weigh your food so you can track it. Now, once you get good at tracking, you may not have to do it at all. But remember, keto is a learning process, so a good scale and a good tracking software. That's number one, number two. Number three is that you want to go out and select foods that are higher in fat and easier. So for example, macadamia nuts, 90% fat. Purchase things like heavy cream. Purchase things like coconut oil. Cook with coconut oil. Purchase uh, supplements could be medium chain triglycerides. Uh, that's gonna be very beneficial. On top of all of that, um, I'm, I'm gonna recommend you get a variety of vegetables. The vegetables should be green, leafy green, but also things, so I'd recommend things like broccoli, um, uh, things like spinach, lettuce, uh, more like romaine lettuce, different versions of lettuce, like spring lettuce, and uh, cauliflower, um, broccoli, a large variety because with all of your meals, you're going to actually want to have a variety of vegetables. That's very, very important because you want to feed your good gut microbiome, but also you want to be able to stay full, especially if you're trying to lose weight. Um, one of the questions we had at earlier I wasn't able to address is if I'm if if, uh, if fats are nine calories per gram and carbs are four calories per gram, I'm not going to be as full because there's less actually um, volume. Well, you can make up for that volume by actually having a lot of vegetables, and also remember that as your ketones get up higher, that's going to make you a lot more satiated than necessarily carbohydrates are concerned. So. Um, those are some of the recommendations that I would definitely um, say to have uh, in general. Okay, brilliant. And just following on from that, so if some people go away today and start on a ketogenic diet, but you know after two, three months, they decide it's not for them. Uh, any recommendations? I know you've touched on some of it, but for coming off of it, is there any kind of things we need to watch out for, such as carbohydrate tolerance maybe after a ketogenic diet? Okay, so... This is actually one thing I didn't touch on, and I want to emphasize is that when you go to a ketogenic diet, you kind of become um, fixed on using fat as your primary fuel. So research, especially from Jeff Folick and now more recently our lab, show you're not going to use carbs as well as you did before. You can regain that adaptability, but at first that's not going to happen, okay? So realize that you're not going to be as tolerant to carbs um, your pancreas isn't used to producing as much insulin. So if you're going to jump, right, I'm going to, oh, I'm going to go right back to carbs. Okay. Or if you come out of a contest and you go, oh, I'm going to have pizza, you know, and, and binge for a long time and have a bunch of carbs, you are going to gain a lot of fat. Just realize that. So again, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to have a slow reintroduction, like maybe a gram of carbs per kilogram of body weight uh, is going to be important. Um, 
uh, per week, you know, so maybe one gram this week per kilogram, next week two grams per kilogram, uh, stick with that, then three grams per kilogram, and things of that nature. So, and then start titrating your protein um, up. So these are some of the things that um, I would sort of recommend uh, on that diet for coming off of the diet. Give yourself time. Okay, great. And we had a question earlier about contest prep. Would anything change from a normal ketogenic diet if you were doing it more for someone that was uh, competing? And also, what do you feel about using a ketogenic diet after a competition? Oh, those are beautiful questions. Um, and it's actually a great way to sort of um, end this Google Hangout. Um, and first off, guys, thanks for all of your questions. I really appreciate them. Um, so first question is, would you use keto on a, on a contest prep? And I told you, for example, my good friend Mark Coles is, is using a lot of this. Actually, John Gorman, I'm going to go up and speak at his at his bodybuilding summit, um, the 8th uh, and 9th coming up. And they both use ketogenic dieting for their some of their athletes. And w what I would say is that I'd use the same ratios. I'd use 70 75% fat. I'd still use 20 to 25% protein and around 5% carb. Um with someone contest prepping, if their activity is very high, they might be able to get away more with that targeted ketogenic dieting that I talked about. And the other thing that I'm going to say is this. Even though you can't handle carbs as well, your muscles peripherally might be more sensitive to carbohydrates, okay? Um, even though you can't release as much insulin, which means if you do introduce a small amount of carbohydrates, your muscles will take them up much quicker. So basically, we did a study where we mimicked going into a contest, and we took people, and basically after keto, again, we gave them one gram of, uh, of carbs per kilogram and three grams of carbs per kilogram. When they went on one grams of carbs per kilogram, basically went all to their muscle, and they peaked in about two to three days where their muscles had filled out. Now, that's crazy that you could replenish your carbohydrate source at that low amount, but Jeff Bullock actually showed that people who are keto adapted can actually replenish carbohydrates even in a low carbohydrate state. So just a little is fine. So the next thing is usually when someone carbs up for a contest, they go really high carb maybe the day before to fill out. If you're keto, you only want a small amount, like a gram per kilogram. That's number one. The last question that I want to answer is this. What about when you come off of a ketogenic diet? Or so, excuse me, what if you weren't ketogenic dieting and you came off and you use it as coming off the contest. Now, we don't have a lot of research when we talk about coming off contest. You know, people talk about reverse dieting. We have literally zero studies on that. Um, what I can tell you is that when you look at research, we know that when you come off, when you are dieting down near the end of your diet, you're actually preferentially uh, using muscle instead of fat. Your body strategically wants to get rid of metabolically active tissue at the end of the diet. So the leaner you get, the more at risk you and the more danger you are of losing muscle. That's why someone like maybe up to 10% body fat might be able to maintain muscle and they dip underneath that and they start wasting away because as fat goes away, you stop sparing muscle. Now, when you come off of a contest, your body, everyone's like, I'm anabolic, I'm anabolic. In actuality, you're primarily anabolic in fat tissue. And your body, think, why would your body, from an adaptation standpoint, why would your body come off a contest diet where you've been dieting for a really long time and go, hey, I know, I got a great idea. Let me add a metabolically active tissue like muscle. It's the worst thing your body could do for survival. Yeah, it's awesome to be um, have a lot of muscle. Looks great. But from a survival standpoint, your body's not going to want to do it after dieting. So preferentially add fat. My theory, and this is a hypothesis, is that if you went to a keto diet, now your body's preferential fuel is fat, okay? If it's preferential fuel is fat, you're not going to store it as readily coming off of a contest. So basically, my thought is that if you came out of a contest, you get your calories back up quick. I don't think you should up your calories over a long time because you're going to maintain a calorie deficit, and that's only going to hurt you more and make your metabolism slow more. And there's evidence to support that. But what you want to do is you want to get your calories back up. So possibly first you get your calories back up on a keto diet, raise your metabolism. Now you're not storing fat. And then if you want to transition back to carbs, transition back like I suggested. So 
Uh, so that's my answer to that question. Guys, I want to thank you uh, again. Great interaction. And, you know, I'll see you guys. You can follow us actually um, at The Muscle Prof on Instagram, also The Muscle Prof on Facebook, as well as Twitter. And you can follow my Muscle Prof column on bodybuilding.com. I'm always looking to interact with you guys, and I'll see you soon. Thanks.